All right. Perfect. All right, so I am Trelawney Michelle. I'm the author of Correct Tea. And I'm gonna start off just doing a PowerPoint because I actually introduced myself in here too. So can everybody see it? Good, all right. So Black history, the Black history of economics and banking in Savannah specifically, but even if you ain't in Savannah, this still, you'll get, still get some good out of here too. Let's minimize this here. All right, so today, like this is the GPS, basically what we're gonna be talking about. Me, I'm gonna introduce myself, the project, what Craig Teep mean, what the book is about, Gullah Geechee culture, enslaved women in Savannah's marketplace, what enterprising, what entrepreneurship even looked like during the days of reconstruction, um, West Broad Street and Wage Earners Bank, um, the boycott and the deconstruction of West Broad Street, and then we'll do some Q&A. So from one of my elders, um, one of his quotes, even like when I started doing this project, before I even fully knew the, the big scope of everything that I was doing, this is something that he told me that really showed me how important the work was. He was like, it's history you don't want to lose, see, because most of the witnesses is gone. And sure enough, out of the 21 plus elders that I interviewed for the Crack Tea Project, the first one rather, only about three or four of them are still living. I believe it's three. And Mr. Stephen Williams was one of the first ones to pass too. Um, about myself, so I was born in Monroe, Louisiana, which is considered the Delta. I was raised between Savannah and New Orleans. So as we know, Savannah is considered the low country and New Orleans is considered, you know, being a part of the Gulf. Um, and, I, and I love being from all three places too, because I think just, the, and I really spent almost, well, I've been in Savannah the longest now, but otherwise, you know, if you'd asked me about five years ago, I would have spent pretty much equal time between all three. And I think it gives me the benefit of being a local and a transplant in all three places. So like I was born in Monroe, but when I go there, it's like I still, I still notice the distinction. Sometimes when you're from somewhere and you live there most or all of your life, you don't see the differences in what, you, what makes your community or your culture different from other ones because it's pretty much all you know. It's so ordinary to you. And so that's really what my work is all about, like illuminating what's otherwise ordinary. I published my first book in 2014. I did some of everything. I started working when I was 14 years old. So I worked in retail and everything, but these are the jobs that really made a difference. And, um, what I do now really led me to where I am now. So working as a CNA in nursing homes, uh, work, so that was like, that really put me in position with elders. I was working with them with all day. Even one of my books is about uh, the life of one of my um, patients that I had. She was, um, became one of the first black women millionaires in New Orleans. So I kind of tweaked, tweaked a few things and wrote a book about her life. I was also a 911 dispatcher here in Savannah for four years. I was a teacher for some years on high school and college level. And I was now also a full-time writer and editor. That's what I do, period. I ghostwrite books, edit books, et cetera. Um, I graduated from SSU, political science, thought I wanted to be an attorney. I was gonna be a prosecutor to put more of us on that side and bring some more justice for my people. And then I realized I don't really think that's what I want to do. I just love history. I love writing and I love truth telling. And I realized that I can do that through writing. So I went to SCAD, got an MFA in writing, and I've been doing that ever since too. Internship at the Library of Congress American Folk Life Center. That was a really dope opportunity going up to Washington, D.C. And, and quick fun fact, I didn't know what the Library of Congress was before I went up there. I thought it was literally a library for the members of Congress. And, it, and that's what it was once upon a time. But now nah, it's just like, it's for, open for public access. It's a library that's full of libraries. It's pretty cool. Um, then I published Crack Teen in 2019. Um, and last year, I was crowned Savannah's Best Local Author by Connect Savannah. So you ain't got to try to read all of this, but this is the book itself and what it's about. So when you hear me say crack tea, that means to speak. So I'm actually cracking my tea right now, talking to y'all and telling y'all about this. This is considered an oral history. So I went out and interviewed people I got them to crack their own tea to tell me about the history. I wanted to know what was life like between 1920 and 1970 in Savannah, Georgia. What some of the things you've been through, like as a community, like how hard was life for black people in Savannah, but like even in your own family, in your own personal life. What, you know what I'm saying? Like if y'all weren't going to the doctors, like how were you taking care of yourself? What kind of food were you eating? How, what was your entertainment like? Like all kinds of questions like that. And, and these are the similar questions that I tell people, y'all need to be asking the elders in your own family and community and churches and etc um 
And so some of the stories that's included in here, it's like Miss Miss Mady, for example, telling me how her parents were sharecroppers and they had to run after her daddy sold a pig without permission. Um, Mr. Roosevelt telling me, for example, he watched his mother get stabbed, but it wasn't no hospital, no doctor around, no telephone. So their natural remedy for that was like grabbing some cobweb from spider, you know, a spider cobweb and stuffing the wounds with that to stop the bleeding. I got some protest stories in there about, you know, segregation. Even Miss uh, Mary Butler Smith, her mother, whose real name was Queen Elizabeth Butler, becoming Savannah's first black woman to own a car. Numbers running so much, so many really good stories to him. About the book itself, the process, this ain't everything, but it's it's like a quick little timeline. So in November 2016 is really when it all began. So I started reading these slave narratives, which was really, really eye-opening for me because prior to that, I thought that if I wanted to read some words and stories that came from formerly enslaved people, that I was going to have to um, hear from, you know, read something about Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, you know, the names that we hear all the time already over and over and over. But now, nah, like, during the Great Depression, you had the Federal Writers Project, which was part of the Works uh, Works Project Administration, WPA, I think that's what it stands for. And that was basically the writers, Federal Writers Project was the way that the federal government was getting teachers, librarians, writers, artists back to work, putting some money in their pockets. They were like, hey, y'all go out and interview formerly enslaved people, get their stories. And so you have these like, they're sorted by region and you have tens of thousands of stories, Savannah, South Carolina, wherever slavery existed, you have these slave narratives. And I was addicted to them. Like I was reading them all, all day, all night. And I literally remember it was like three o'clock in the morning. I popped up and I was like, who's collecting our elder stories today? And, you know, I did a quick Google search and I didn't figure anyone in my area was. And so, and I decided I wanted to do that because something else too, you know, I was paying attention to the weaknesses, like what could be the threats against it. And I, doing more research, particularly with the Federal Writers Project, I realized that a lot of them people who were going out and doing that interview when they were white. So of course they were interviewing black people. And a lot of those black people were still living on the plantation that they were once enslaved on. So that made me wonder like, what's the likelihood that I'm gonna tell the truth to a white person when I'm still living on this man land. So I was like, okay, well, I have a lot of benefit here. You know, like I'm a black woman they're more likely to give me even more. Like those narratives are really, really good, but I figure like I could get even more because I'm more likely to be trusted. Um, so fast forward to that, that next January, I did my very first interview. That's actually my daughter's great granddaddy. Um, the next month I did my second interview and I was doing them one after the other. Then I could do that internship. By November, 2019, I interviewed the last elder. By this point, it was even hard to say, I got to press stop. I got to press the stop button because I had been putting it on Facebook. Hey, y'all, if y'all know anybody, any black elders in Savannah over the age of 80, let me know. I want to interview them. It took a while, but by, by the time I was two years in, everybody hit me up. Hey, you need to talk to so-and-so. You need to talk to so-and-so. And I was talking to so many so-and-sos, I was realizing I wasn't going to ever get the book done if I ain't stopped. So I had to stop. So then December 2019, released the book. Perfect. Then next January, I built an online crack tea community to start with the mission of like, we all cousins, to show us how much we have in common like these stories that I'm gathering because I'm realizing like you know I, I spent a lot of time you know from Louisiana too so I'm realizing a lot of things that my elders telling me here my elders telling me in Louisiana too things that we trying to say are like specifically Gullah Geechee culture I'm like nah like we was doing that in Louisiana too like so in, no matter where I go in the world like when I went to South America no matter where I go like I see so much of us all over this world the same so many of the same dishes that we eat and so many of the same rhythms in the music etc so I kind of started this hashtag we all cousins um and then February 2020 I started crack teeth for kids where I go out and do workshops with the um schools summer camps nonprofits, churches etc if some kids there I want to be there with them um, so Gullah Geechee then and Gullah Geechee now. So what makes somebody Gullah Geechee? If you think about it, it's really, it has all to do with your ancestral roots. So you have ancestral roots that are particular countries out of West Africa. They were chosen for their strength, yeah. Also their familiarity with being in a hot coastal landscape because a lot of the white settlers who were moving down to Georgia and Savannah in this time, they, could, they were dying fast. They couldn't handle the climate. They couldn't handle the bugs in this area. Like it took, so 
a lot of people from this particular, from the coast of West Africa, they were already used to it too. So they were chosen for that in addition to their experience in cultivating, you know, growing rice and other crops, indigo, things like that. And they were transported, of course, we know like to New Orleans too and Virginia. But when we talking about Gullah Geechee culture, they were transported to the Carolinas, Georgia and Florida, the Sea Islands included. And they developed a unique culture that we now call Gullah Geechee. So when we think of culture that includes how you talk, what you eat, the traditions you maintain, your religion, pra your religious practice, spirituality practices, rather, all of that is consist, you know, considered your culture. And now Gullah Geechee now, so that's important for me to point out because a lot of people almost think of it as like the way that we incorrectly think about Native Americans sometimes, like they don't exist no more. And now nah, it's not the truth. Like it very much so still exists. Unfortunately, when I was teaching, sometimes I asked the question like, who all in here is Geechee or ever, you know, Gullah Geechee, nobody raised their hands. Well, who, who all ever heard of it before? I might get like one or two people raised their hand. And then when I start to ask, well, where's your grandmama from? Where your people from? You know, how long y'all been here? And they might've been here for so long, so many generations, but they don't connect with that because they were never taught that. They never heard that phrase. So bringing it all back full circle and realizing what that is. So now you will say our ancestral roots are, are still in West Africa, yeah, but also now because we've been here for so long, our ancestral roots are also in the Carolinas, Georgia and Florida, and we're scattered throughout the diaspora. So you everywhere, when I was up in DC, I was I met plenty of Geechee people telling me like, oh, you from Savannah? Okay, my people from Carolina, da, 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 da. so many Geechee people all over the world. Um, and like I said, language, food, traditions, and all of that vary based on your location. So you have Geechees in Charleston that don't sound nothing like Geechee's in Savannah. And that the meals are very too. So like Charleston, I had my first time oyster perlu. Had never heard of that before. It's just not something that, that exists in Savannah. Red rice is popular in both of them. But then you have a distinction. You have something called Charleston red rice and you have Savannah red rice. And I asked a few chefs in different places, what were the differences? And they were like, one of them fluffier, one of them used long grain rice, the other one used short. So it's same culture, but it's still some little bitty nuances in there that make them different. All right, so Savannah is really special because we, we had a lot of freshwater Africans and I'm explaining what that means, but first let me take y'all through this timeline. So 1619 is when the first enslaved African arrived in Virginia. So it first, per, first enslaved African to arrive and it wasn't called the United States then, but just for the sake of it, let's call it now because it was owned by British, by Britain. Um, in 1733, Georgia became one of the colonies and Savannah was founded. So Georgia was the last of the 13 colonies and Savannah was the first city to be quote unquote founded in, in Georgia. And I, you know, I put the quotes on there because it was already a land with the name and with culture and people here before the settlers came in and um, colonized it. So that's a whole, that's almost a hundred years right there from when the first enslaved person arrived that Georgia even became a colony. Now fast forward to 1751, slavery was legalized in Georgia. And I'm gonna talk about why that's so, because that wasn't a moral reason. It's not that they thought slavery was wrong. I'm gonna talk about that in the next slide. Now, 1790, oh, well, no, no, let's go back a little bit, 1751. So by the time slavery was legalized in Georgia, slavery had already been going on in this country for more than 100 years. So all of that to say, if it's been going on for more than 100 years, you got generations where that's been existed. It, it, it's been existing. So you had a mama, a daughter, a granddaughter, you know, you had time for at least three to four generations to all, already have been born and engraved into this uh, culture of slavery. Whereas uh, if Georgia legalized in 1751, all of them are pretty much fresh Africans. The accent is still intact. They probably ain't even speak, they ain't even speaking English, a, a lot of them yet. So, and the cultures are still the same, like they fighting back harder because they resisting that, which all of them do. Now, even I'm pretty sure the first person to arrive in Virginia too, but we still fighting over here. Like we just got here, we still bucking. They even talk about the, we, if you ever study like Jamaican culture, for example, you've probably heard about the Maroons, like Queen Nanny or the Maroons. But what a lot of people don't know is the Maroon community existed wherever slavery existed. So there were Maroon communities in Virginia, in North Carolina, in Louisiana, and in Savannah. When I was reading one of the books that I studied, and I'm gonna share with you in this presentation too, they were talking about Maroon camps that were set up on Ogeechee River. And Maroon camps, for example, not for example, but rather by definition, they were basically, they were so gangster that they were saying like, and they would fight back that white settlers and enslavers would say, you know what? 
y'all can maintain y'all freedom. Just stay over there and just promise that you're not going to come back and try to enslave nobody else and we won't bother y'all. You know what I'm saying? And that's something that's not taught about, you know, pretty often. We hear about, of course, we hear about slavery and every now and then we hear about a few that fought back, but mostly that's, you know, that ends in devastation. Um, and now going to 1798, Georgia said no more freshwater Africans. <laughs> And that was for um, economic reasons, yeah, but it was also because so many issues was coming up with it. It was just, the population was becoming more and more black, first of all, and it was too many rebellions happening, too many people fighting back, and we not about to have the manpower to, to control these black people in a minute, so no more. And then in 1808, the federal government said no more freshwater Africans. Now that's a theme that's gonna come up a few times in this um, presentation. Georgia being before, doing something before the federal government does it. 1825, Savannah's majority black. And I specifically put African slash Geechee here because I want you, you know, to get that into the language. So by 1825, so that's um, less than a hundred years after slavery was legalized in Georgia, majority of population, majority of the population was African slash Geechee. 1858, the Wanderer landed. The Wanderer was a ship that, so when slavery, when they said no more freshwater Africans, meaning that you can't go to Africa and bring none back, you can have, slavery is still legal, you can keep what you have, but you can't go to Africa and bring none back. When they said that, when they made that illegal, the value skyrocketed. So once the value skyrocket on anything, anytime anything is prohibited, we think about the uh, alcohol, when alcohol was illegal, it was so expensive because it was illegal. You couldn't do it. Same thing with um, with slavery. So you still had some white men getting into ships and going over there and getting them and trying to hide it as pretend like it's something else, bringing them back over here. In this particular case, this was just one of the ones that got caught. They act like it was the last one. When I, I always say if it's one of something, it's more of something. If it's a few, it's a bunch. So if this, this one is one of the ones that got caught, then we know that it was a lot more of them. Um, so, and that just goes to show that even though they said no more freshwater Africans are allowed, we still had a whole lot of them still coming into the city. And then in 1865, slavery was outlawed. Let me minimize this because I cannot see. Okay. And so Georgia's delay in legalization, like I said, that was strategy. That wasn't morals. It wasn't, they didn't wait so long to say slavery is legal here because they were like, it's wrong and we don't believe in it. Nah. At that time, the 13 colonies was owned by Britain. Florida, which is right up a cartwheel away from Georgia, was owned by Spain. Spain set up a strategy to say that they sent word out to black people saying, if y'all can escape from Georgia and make your way over here to Florida, you'll be free. All you gotta do is agree to fight for us, you know, if it go down. And of course, you know, they took them up on that. So oh, James Oglethorpe, he decided, well, if we make it legal here, we won't have that issue. We won't be indirectly strengthening Florida's army if we keep it legal, I'm sorry, illegal here. And then eventually it was too many, too many people realizing how much money they were missing out on. It was like, you know what? We're going to go ahead and make that thing legal here. But even while it, because when Georgia finally did legalize slavery, it was already 400 enslaved people living here. And before that, they were still renting. They will rent them from South Carolina. So in Savannah specifically, like you have streets called like Drayton Street. That was named after Ann Drayton because when they were building up the streets and the roads and things like that, Overthorpe and them will rent enslaved people from South Carolina from Ann Drayton's plantation. And to thank her, they named the street after her. The same for streets like Bull Street, for example. So just because it wasn't illegal, it wasn't legal yet, it wasn't for moral reasons, like I said. And another thing too, is when we think about the numbers, because I'm gonna be throwing some percentages out there, Savannah wasn't as big as it is now. So now when we see Savannah, we got like South Side, West Side, East Side, Downtown, et cetera. This is from Ms. Barnett Good Walker to explain what Savannah included back then. There was North Broad Street, which is Bay Street today. So think of Bay Street, Oglethorpe Avenue, East Broad, and then MLK, because that's what West Broad Street is MLK today. That small area, that's what Savannah was. Everything else around that was the county and it was really unincorporated. And so on the black people pretty much settled on the edges of the city. And that's, as she would say, when African people were enslaved in Savannah. And then once Savannah became more and more developed, so now we got the roads, we're gonna cut down as many trees as most of the trees we need to, we got all the roads, we got houses. 
slavery in Savannah became more urban than plantation style. So when we typically think of slavery, we think of picking cotton and things like that, but it changed up a little bit here. So you had more people being like butlers, chauffeur, chauffeurs, messengers, um, of course, the cooks and the servants, sewing, things like that, uh, running errands. Um, it, and that's not to say that it was easier, it was just different. But they'd also, too, be rented out to nearby plantations. And then another really, really, really big point that leads us directly into what we'll be talking about today is that Savannah's enslaved are often entrepreneurs. So this is one of the books that I was talking about, Slavery and Freedom in Savannah. It's a lot of really good information in here. Um, in the marketplace, and this is the, one of the quotes from it, in the marketplace, social status was ambiguous. So social status being who got it and who don't financially. Who's the rich, who's the middle class, who's the poor. Social status was ambiguous. You didn't know who had what, and bonds women could buy cheap and sell high. So a lot of times the enslaved people, they had their own gardens. So we hear a lot about, you know, enslaved, during slavery, we were stuck with scraps like chitlins and pigtails and the stuff that, you know, they didn't want to eat. I'm not saying that's not true. That just wasn't true everywhere. And in Savannah, you know, that wasn't the case for a lot of people too. They had their own gardens and sometimes even they had their own livestock. You might have your own, a few chickens running around the yard. So if that's the case, I know my like maybe some Miss So-and-so down the street, she too old to go out there and sell her veggies. So I'm gonna go get them from her and now I can come back to the market and I can sell it high because I grew it myself. You know, I got it from somebody cheap, I bought cheap and I sell high. Um, and, that, and that kept them as successful as their free counterparts. And with that money, some of the things that they could do is, now what was true, you got a little, you didn't get many clothes and shoes to start the year off with your blankets and things like that. But with that money, they can um, compensate and buy some of those things for themselves. In this way, enslaved women in and around Savannah utilized customary African skills in the local market to gain like some kind of freedom for themselves and establish themselves as an integral part of the urban economy. This is a picture here. This came from the Library of Congress, but it's in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and so you see some of the people making their way to the marketplace. You still see how they are so very much so African. They got the baskets on their head, et cetera, which is so brilliant because now you have more capacity to carry more things with you. Because as you can see, it's probably only one cart and not one ox cart and not everybody had one. And here's another, here's a quote from a friend of mine in, um, out of Charleston, Chef B.J. Dennis. And it's not about Charleston. He was talking about the low country. Um, and this picture here is actually, um, is a depiction of Savannah vendors. The vendors were an important fixture, particularly after emancipation. You know, emancipation is after slavery, that's the freedom. And also before emancipation. In those days, there was no grocery store. So you would have to buy veggies and protein almost every day if you wanted to eat. The main supplier of vegetables was our Gullah Geechee ancestors, working lower class folk, but they were rich in spirit. They made sure all the folks of all classes and backgrounds was nourished with their veggies. Through enslavement and after, there needs to be some respect for our culture and the people who made the city what it is, even if they didn't get the love they deserve. Now, in that particular part, he was talking about Charleston, but as we know, that, that applies in Savannah too. As a matter of fact, whenever I talk about, whenever I, read the introduction of Crack Teeth, the book I wrote, people always tell me like, man, those same words could apply to where I live. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you go to the restaurants, you know, a lot of the restaurants downtown and they're white owned and maybe even you're served by white people, but the kitchen is full of black people. So it's like a lot of the same narratives, same situation still applying over and over in so many different cities. This came from another really good book that is not even being published no more. So it's a rare one. It's called The Negro in Savannah. And this particular chapter was called Black and White Relationships in Savannah from 1865 to 1875. And as we know, 1865 is when slavery was outlawed. So that's the 10 years right after that. For better or for worse, whites and blacks were joined together by bonds much stronger even than those of matrimony, which is marriage. And that bond was economic survival, meaning money had to be made. <laughs> so I don't know, I don't care how you feel about me, how I feel about you, you can hate me, I hate you, but we gotta get this money. So, you know, that was a big, that was a big deal in Savannah. In this particular era, so from 1865 when slavery ended all the way up to like 1900 or so, that, that era is called reconstruction. So that basically means slavery is over, the civil war is done. The civil war done tore up so much of the country 
we need to rebuild ourselves. We need to reconstruct. We also need to figure out what we need to do with these black people. Now we got millions of black people in this country who are now free. What do we do with them? So that's pretty much what reconstruction era is and means. So, and now in that same book, fast forward to 1890, which is still reconstruction era. Here were some popular jobs amongst black folks in, in Savannah. You got laborers, farmers, servants, carpenters, mill, you know, messengers, wood choppers, et cetera, et cetera, masons, brick makers, barbers, painters, boot and shoot make shoot makers, cooks, herbalists, conjurers. I, I added that last one myself, herbalists and conjurers, because that was another big one that I actually read in Drums and Shadows and realized that, oh yeah, this was a major thing. This wasn't just something that we were doing for fun. And what that was is like using um using things from nature to get what we need rather like stuff in the cobwebs and the wounds that's an example of that and also um if it's like I'm, I'm i'm praying but i need some money i need some healing i need some justice you know i can also i would tap into that spirituality um to get what i need so you had all of these popular jobs right during this particular time period well now i wanted to highlight a few people who were making things happen, but weren't necessarily involved in any of these jobs. And another thing that I usually do on the Instagram page for Crack Tea is ask like, if I scratched out 1890 and put like 2022, what would be the answer today? You know, so like all those agricultural laborers, because you know, at that time we were an agricultural society. Today we're an in industrial society, which is really what all the civil, the civil, uh, the civil war was all about. <laughs> um, the North won, and the North was the industrialist, and so now because they won, we're all an industrial society. So now instead of agricultural laborers and farmers, we have warehouse workers and crane workers. You know, that's like the number one in Savannah. Like everybody, if you're from here or you've been here for a while we all either related to or know somebody who working in a warehouse um so similar and barbers still up there hairstylists so it's the, and servant servant still because you know working in a restaurant that's considered what you what you would be considered to be hotels you still would be considered a servant so i still try to think like ah the popular jobs then and what they are now because i always look at it, which is true the present day this is already history it's just history in the making here are some of the people who are doing, who are making the movers and shakers who weren't doing something that was on that list. This is Josephine Styles Jennings. She don't have a picture, so I had to just put something up there for her. Um, she was once described as Savannah's most active color businesswoman. She started her business career in the late 1890s. She opened a meat market, um, let's just say, and and the grocery store in Yamacraw. Now back then, Yamacraw was in a pro housing projects that was a neighborhood of houses so that's what that's what she had then then she opened up a dance hall on bay street then she opened up a vaudeville hall on west broad street which like i told you now that's mlk then she moved back to young across she opened a saloon and then she opened peak and theater which they said was one of the most beautiful theaters in the country it had uh two stores two stories it seated over 300 people she opened that on West Broad Street and then she's expanded. She opened up small amusement houses in Jacksonville, Aikens, Brunswick, Albany, Georgia. This was a this was a a hustler. I don't even want to say that word. She was just a go-getter. This was a very ambitious woman who was making things happen. The Chicago Defender described her as a good negotiator between artists and theater owners. The Chicago Defender for um as a some more context, is owned, it was it was started by Robert Sings that Robert Abbott. Seems that was his mother's maiden name. Um, he's from Savannah. So he grew up in the call, what would be now called the Coffee Bluff area, area. He moved to Chicago during the Great Migration and he started the Chicago Defender up there. And that became one of the biggest newspapers in the black community, all like for, for the US, for the whole country. They covered all kind of news, everything that was happening tragically against black people and good news too, like we see here, because they even, they featured Josephine Styles Jennings. And it was started by a man from Savannah. And then I wanna talk about Soul C. Johnson because he was really considered the voice of Savannah during his tenure. Um, as we know, it's a high school now named after him, but um, a little bit about him. He was born four years after slavery ended. At 11 years old, he got his first job. And that was really, really popular then because even when I write for a lot of my elders, I use my ancestry account to check the census records for them, for them and their, their mother, their parents and their grandparents. If they knew their grandparents name, I check all of that. And I found like a lot back then 
you had a lot of nine-year-old boys <laughs> working, a lot of 10, nine and 10-year-old girls working as babysitters a lot of times. Um, so that was really common. So when he was 11, he got his job with Savannah Morning News. He was throwing papers. Then he got hired by a black man who was the owner of Savannah Tribune named John DeVoe. In 1889, DeVoe put Johnson in charge of the paper and he took it to the next level. I mean, he got an, uh, from the building, the audience, the things that they were talking about, it went from sounding a little more safe to really putting themselves out there and saying like, nah, like this is what's facing the black community. This is what we need to do. This is what the Ku Klux Klan is doing. And this is how we ain't scared. Like that's who Soul C. Johnson was. When DeVoe died in 1910, Johnson bought the Savannah Tribune. So now he was the owner, the second owner of it. And he bought a bigger building for it. And that bigger building was moved to West Broad Street. Um, he believed that black folk had a responsibility to save themselves via entrepreneurship, economic corporation, and land ownership. So during this time too, so now think about it, this still kind of like reconstruction era, a little after reconstruction, ain't too, the shadows of, you know, slavery is still right there. A lot of people, white and black, are trying to figure out what do we need to do? Like, What's the answer to these struggles and these problems that we have? And then a lot of Black people, Marcus Garvey, but a lot of leaders before Marcus Garvey too, tried to convince Black folks that they need to lead the South. They was like, look, y'all facing a lot of white terrorism down there. You need to get out of there. Either move up here to Kansas, move up North, um, or leave, leave the U.S. period. Go back, that's the move back, the back to move, the back to Africa movement leave Africa period. And Johnson disagreed. He was like, although I could find so many leaders who were like team uh, back to Africa, Johnson wasn't. He was like, don't let them people run you from your home. Like we built this thing. Those aren't his verbatim words, but they're mine. But that is what he was saying, basically like, nah, like y'all don't, you don't have to leave. Don't feel compelled to leave. Like, let's stay here. Let's fight. Let's build. Let's, you know what I'm saying? And he was a busy man. In addition to running the Savannah Tribune, he was also vice president of the Wage Earners Bank, which we're going to talk about more. Um, he was secretary of the Georgia State Executive Committee, grand secretary at the Masons. I mean, I don't know how this man had time for anything. Um, director at the YMCA and even Carnegie Library, which is so beautiful. And we're going to talk about that more in this presentation, too. He was a curator there. And a curator... It's just who makes it look like what it is, who decides like what books gonna go in the front, you know what I'm saying, like what books gonna face out versus going in and you, you have curators at museums, libraries, etc. So they really give you that experience when you go in there, you know, they, they have to bear all of that in mind. Who's our audience and what are they looking for and what's gonna make them want to come back again and again and again. Madam Birdie Freeman is another one. I really wanted to highlight her because you had a whole lot of hairstylists in Savannah back then, and you got a whole lot of hairstylists in Savannah today. Hairstylists today in Savannah making a whole lot of money, just like they were back then too. Like it's just, it ain't nothing new. And I just, I really love that piece of history. And I try to share it with as many hairstylists as I know. Um, Birdie was born in 1887. She was born in South Carolina. She moved to Savannah in 1903 and she opened a grocery store with her husband. Um, in 1908, she opened a hair salon. So you can see grocery stores was a, another really, really popular investment during that time. Um, in 1908, she opened a hair salon. Six years later, in that same building that the hair salon was in, she opened a beauty school. So now she went from just doing hair to now teaching other Black women how to, you know, how to do hair too, as we would say, do hair. In the, um, and it was located at 456 Montgomery Street. So if anybody want to go out there and see what's out there, I think I went out there before. And it's nothing right there. It's um, something else was like right beside it, but you could tell it was knocked down and the bigger building was built right there. Um, she taught, her school taught biology and anatomy. So it wasn't just how to curl it, how to straighten it, how to pin it up. Nah, like they went deep. They actually talk about like the, bi like I said, the biology, anatomy. And it was very, very community and family oriented, which African people tend to be. That is our ancestral traditions. So it wasn't this thing of like, you got to find somebody to keep kids. I can't come today because I ain't got nobody to keep my kids. No, nah, like you got kids, you bring them with you. And that's typically how we did, how we operate it. So in a lot of West African marketplaces, you'll see a woman with a baby like wrapped around her on her hip or something because this is 
family life is integrated into everything you do. Dance too. <laughs> in 1947, Birdie opened a flower shop. So you can see like, so what they call it today, multiple streams of income. Yeah, like she had her pans out in a lot of different pots, making a lot of money. But she was also, she also supported the civil rights movement. And I'm gonna bring her name back up later because of this. So issues in the community were discussed at her school. Money was collected to help pay for bailouts and attorneys. So the agreement was a lot of time. That, so like when you think about protests, sit-ins and wait-ins, that's usually done by young people. Older people really, they can't do that. I want you to physically, like you can't be getting down on my knees. Like I won't be able to get back up. <laughs> I can't afford for no police to become hosing me down and beating me up. Like I, I'm too old for that or I got too much to lose. So kind of like the agreement was that, yeah, let the young people do it. But as the older community, so yeah, especially if you were property owning black folks, you were expected to pool your money together to make sure these young people got money to be bailed out when they got locked up and they got money for civil rights attorneys. So it was all, like I said, just working together, real big community effort. And on her 1940 census, as we know what the census is taking every 10 years, I think, she put that her highest grade was fifth grade and that was common back then too for a very long time because even my own grandparents my grandmother didn't pass sixth grade and my grandfather didn't pass eighth grade um her occupation was a proprietor in the beauty industry and she said she had income from other sources so she was basically telling y'all like i gotta i got my hands in a lot of pots i'm making money from everywhere um, the last one that I'm pointing out, Curtis V. Cooper. So we probably know the medical facility named after him, but I don't know if a lot of people know about him, period. He was born in Savannah, born and raised in Savannah, born in 1932, graduated from Tompkins at the top of his class, went on to Savannah State, graduated with a degree in biology, wanted to be a doctor, but he couldn't afford medical school. That's a real life situation, right? But his model was that everything is possible if you believe in yourself, and he proved that to be true. So and along with so C. Johnson, reminder of how important economic cooperation is, which basically that means we have to put our money together if we're going to make stuff happen, put our ideas, our money together. If somebody else already doing it or got an idea to do it instead of you doing it too go team up with them and y'all do it together if you if you got a different way you want to do it differently then yeah you go off and do it your own way but otherwise do that thing together so we it can actually get done and serve as many people as possible so this all all collectively all of that is why we still know cooper's name to today so while working with the u.s department of agriculture as a research technician he started thinking back. Like I said, sometimes when you're not from somewhere, you you uh you can see the differences. But that also works when you move away from home. So you can be born, raised in Savannah or wherever your whole life. And as you when you move away, you start thinking about how things is. And that pretty much was the case for Cooper too. He thought about how poor people on the west side of Savannah didn't have access to health care. So it's like it wasn't no facility around for you to go get some health care. If you didn't have the money, you were basically you out of luck you know, and, and it's not right. But so many times we just think that it is what it is. Like, that's just the way it is. But now we need people who think that, no, nah, it's not right. And something needs to be done about it. And that's kind of what Curtis Cooper's mindset was. So he got some of his friends together. They met up in the shed in his backyard and they came up with a plan and he put that plan into motion. So he, he started a fundraising, he started raising the money for a medical center that would treat people who couldn't afford doctor bills and health insurance. And he did that. He was successful. And today that center has been renamed Curtis B. Cooper Primary Health. And it's a few locations. I don't even know how many. It might be what, about three of them. I know they opened one by Oakthorpe Mall. I think it's still one on the east side maybe one downtown so yeah i think it's three somebody correct me if it's more and here's a picture um it doesn't say the picture you know the source of the picture didn't say exactly what they were pooling their money for together in this picture but it was in savannah <laughs> and and this is basically everything that i've been talking about that economic cooperation that's what's happening here so you got some people putting their money together to make something happen that happened over and over and over in Savannah. So that's really that black economics part that I was talking about. Here's another timeline to really bring home the wage earners bank. So in 1899, you had 10 black men who pooled together $102. Today, oh, she told me last week and I don't remember already. I think she said it's about 30, that equals about $30,000 today, I think. Or maybe it was $3,000 today. I don't remember, one or two, but um, 10 black men pooled together $100 basically. So that's basically $10 a piece. And they decided that they were gonna open up a bank and it was called the Wage Earners Bank. 
Um, in 1903, 45 black entrepreneurs met up in the Savannah Tribune office, remember, and Sosie Johnson was own, owned it at that time, and they organized the Negro B Business League. Um, Sosie Johnson was a treasurer of that. Like I said, this was a busy man. In 1906, 11 black businessmen decided to open up a library for black, black folks since they couldn't use the city's white only library. So what had happened with that was the city of Savannah decided that our city doesn't have a library. We need a library. So they linked up with the Georgia Historical Society and they used um, a back room in that office and that was the library. But it was 1906 and it was a whites only library. Black folks couldn't use it. So those 11 black businessmen decided that it ain't is it ain't just is what it is. We need one and we're gonna get us one. So they pulled together their money. They found them some more sponsors and that sponsor was Andrew Carnegie. And he said, Andrew said that if y'all show me what you got, I'll match it and we'll make this thing happen. And they did that. The library opened in 1914. The whites only library, which was owned by the city was still in that back room. So because of that, this was technically the first public library here in Savannah. And so C. Johnson was the curator of that. <laughs> um, what's that, eight more, eight years later? 1914. So this is this, this is a piece of the pie. This ain't all the businesses by no means. But Blacks operated five insurance company, a whole bunch of grocery stores and ice cream parlors, 14 physicians, three dentists, four lawyers, one photographer, three real estate agents, and 93 churches. And I believe we probably still got 89 of them left. <laughs> and that came from one of my favorite books too, W.W. Law and His People, um, written by uh, Father Charles Hoskins or Dr. Charles Hoskins, however you are introduced to him. Six years later in 1920, the Wage Earners Bank became the first Black bank to acquire more than $1 million in assets. The address, 460 West Broad Street. So we circle back like 1899. That, for one, that wasn't even a whole lot of time. And for two, I can only imagine like how many people were trying to tell them it was a bad idea because this wasn't the first, this was the first bank in Savannah to be owned and operated by Black people, but what, it wasn't the first bank that Black people had access to. The first one was the Freedmen's Bureau, which was basically uh, author, you know, owned by the federal government, because you also have Freedmen Bureau that opened up schools and things like that throughout the South. It was kind of, it was a reconstruction effort to help Black people get on their feet. So it's like, they also gave us a bank. And we used that for a while, and that shut down. And then you had another bank, which darn, I should have got the name of it, I can't remember. I know Mechanic Savings Bank was another one, and then it was another one too, and I don't remember the name of that one. And that one was integrated bank um and so C. johnson was saying like yeah we can use that integrated bank but we need our own um and so yeah so all the, those banks have failed and you still somebody i know people were like and y'all want to open up another bank <laughs> and y'all gonna try to do that with ten dollars a piece but they went from that in 1899 to 1920 having a, basically the most successful black bank in the country it was the first one to acquire more than a million dollars in assets here's a few pictures from west broad street um, that were i got them from the georgia historical society so i don't know what those businesses are other than the star theater down there at the bottom in the middle so you had two theaters the star theater and the dunbar theater at the bottom right you have the union station in which a lot of my elders would talk about how um the trains will go like twice a day to atlanta and savannah and back um and you, you know you just had plenty of business fish markets clothing stores photography studios lawyers offices all kind of businesses on west broad street and here's um a few excerpts from crack teeth the book um so miss carolyn died outside of cloverdale she was like and she integrated one of the schools here in savannah i wanted it was either hess or Heard. i don't remember it's in a book though um she said west broad street was thriving it was the hub that was our area and then Ms. Mary Butler Smith off West 41st, she said the whole area was black. Funeral homes, churches, everything in the area. My daddy's tire shop was there too. And across the street, there was a white man who owned a confectionery store. And the building on the next corner was a fish market. Miss Flory came back and said, the Matthew fish market. The fishermen would bring them and dump them on the stall. And then we could select which fish we want. They also had the chicken farm store with live chicken. And we had two movie theaters, Star and Dunbar. Ms. Ruby Jones out of East Savannah, she said, I went to the theaters all the time. A girl went to Beach High with me. She was in a movie with Harry Belafonte and somebody else, and her name was Marilyn. West Broad Street used to jump. There was a lot of clubs, restaurants, and stores. Yeah, I think another one was, was it the Flamingo Club? I don't remember if that one was on West Broad Street or near it, but yeah, it was a lot of clubs on that street too. 
Miss Carolyn Dow said, Yakum and Yakums. That was where we bought all our, our clothes. And then you had this record store, Sam's record store. We had all of the black owned businesses. So I like stories like this because it kind of like reemphasizes why we need to like all the like things like, cause that was ordinary for them back in the day. Like it was just, that was where you went and got some music, the record store, that's where you went and got your clothes. But who knew? I don't think their, their young minds at that time knew that if they fast forward 20, 30, 40 years, that that would just be history. You know, and sort of some of the th same things that we have today. That's why I said it's history in the making. So if we can just turn it and look at it with a new eye, take some pictures. And I would love to see more pictures of West Broad Street, but who was taking pictures of that? Because they just, it's just what it was. That was West Broad Street. So like today we got MLK, but you know, like take, take the pictures, interview the people, write down your memories. And then you had the boycott that changed the game. And I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Yeah. So what happened was black people, you could on Broughton Street, you could shop and you can order food to go there, but you couldn't work there. You couldn't eat there or even try clothes on. One of my elders even said, like, if you bought a hat, you couldn't even try the hat on to see if it fit. Couldn't even try your shoes on and you couldn't refund. If you got home and it didn't fit, you couldn't even get a refund. After the arrest of three students on Broughton Street, um, two of them went to. Oh, I forgot just that fast. So they went to Beach and the other one went to Savannah State. Um, so after they got arrested for doing a sit-in, Black Savannah decided to boycott and protest with even more sit-ins. So that's the only, that was the rule. And WW Law kind of was like, he was the chief, he was the leader of this particular boycott. He was like, the only time y'all need to be on West, on Broughton Street is if you're doing a sit-in. If you ain't doing a sit-in, you don't need to be over there. If you ain't protesting, you don't even need, need to be over there. And like I said earlier, Older, older black folk who own property, they the ones who pool their money together for bailouts. And so here's another timeline. In March, 1960, that's when they got arrested. And that's also when the boycott started. Um, a couple months later, the Chicago Defender reported that the boycott had cost merchants more than $1 million on Broughton Street. That's how much money they lost in just a couple months. Fast forward to the next month, the KKK mad. They throwing bricks in the NAACP members' houses. So C. Johnson responded in the Savannah Tribune. It was like, we will not be intimidated by cowards who are hiding their faces behind uh, sheets and things like that. And that's when I tell you, he was the voice of Black Savannah. Whew. It didn't have the month here, but in that same year, the mayor resigned. Um, in the face of integration. So although we talking about the boycott of Broughton Street right now, it was a lot going on during this time. Schools are integrating, they're trying to integrate the hospitals and medical facilities. So the lot, it's a lot going on. And it's, I'm pretty sure it was a lot of pressure on that man. And so he was like, you know what, I'm done. Um, 19, oh, and the author about Mingle, Mayor Mingle Door. Um, he also, I think he tried to run for city council later on. He didn't he didn't make that. And then later on, he was found with a gunshot wound to his head in his house. I, I'm assuming he must have committed suicide. In 1961, the Savannah Morning News reported that five stores on Broughton Street rather bankrupt than integrate. Fall 1961, white business owners said, you know what? Come on. I agree to call. I, I'm going to stop calling you girl and boy. I call you. I say yes, ma'am and no, sir. Y'all can eat here. You know, and this happened before the Civil Rights Act did it. So that Sunday after the white business owners came and agreed, shook, shook the hand and said what they would do, WW Law said, all right, the boycott done. Y'all can shop on um, Broad Street again. If you have any problems, let us know. 1964, a whole three years later, the Civil Rights Act was passed by the federal government. So that's why I said Georgia and Savannah kind of have a trend of um, legalizing or doing things before the federal government get on board with it. So here's some pictures from that particular boycott. The one on the left actually um, inspired the cover of Crack Tea. So you have Benjamin Van Clark right there in the front. He was really young. I want to say he was about 17 years old. And, but if you look at all the boys there in that picture all the way in the back, all of them look really young. And that just goes to show you, like I said, like young people really make a difference. And when I taught young people, I wanted them, I really emphasized that to make sure they knew that like y'all the ones who make the change i think it was tupac who even said like once you hit 30 kind of like that fire gone you, you would talk about it but you ain't doing nothing you know so it's like the young people that's where the energy come from um uh dang south africa nelson mandela nelson mandela said to move forward as a people you need the energy of the youth and the wisdom of the elders so it's just like pictures like this just bring all of that in mind to me so you see that's right there on bull, bull and brian the next picture over you have a, a young lady right there and she's saying is our money separate 
So I just love that. So all the attitude, everything in there. So like a lot of times when we think back to these time periods, whether it's the period of slavery or Jim Crow, sometimes um, we're led to be, either because it was taught to us directly or indirectly, but we tend to believe that we was real turn the cheek and real soft, or, or you know what I'm saying, and permissive and passive about a lot of things. And that wasn't the case. Even in the non, uh, non-violent movement, it, it by far, it wasn't a show of weakness at all. Um, I remember one of my elders, Ms. Rosa, I think Ms. Rosa Lee, she was, no, her name isn't Ms. Rosa Lee, her auntie name wasn't, she was telling me she was real young, they were on Broad Street, she, the, uh, she found a penny, she went to go pick up the penny, and a white lady said, if you pick that penny up, I'm gonna step on your hand, her auntie told that white lady, if you step on my niece's hand, I'm gonna mop Broad Street with you, so it's like, stories like that is just so important, it's just to show us who we, who we are, and who we've been, and what we're made of. In 1963, residents and entrepreneurs of West Broad Street were ordered to leave for I-16 for the construction of the interstate. So that's a picture of what it looks like today. It's no longer says West Broad Street is now MLK Junior Boulevard. And that name change kind of happened right around the same time that they made them people leave. It was almost like a peace offering. Okay, okay, like you got to move if you live here, if you got your business here, you got to move. But we'll we'll rename the street after one of your leaders. How about that? And every city had a Black Wall Street. So for Savannah, that was that was on um, West Broad Street for us. In New Orleans, that was Claiborne Avenue. In Tulsa, that was Greenwood Avenue. You got Columbus, Oakland, Durham. And Durham is like where this picture come from, the Black Wall Street thing. Um, DC, St. Paul, Chattanooga, Miami, Jacksonville, Detroit, Austin, that's just some of them. They are everywhere, like wherever there was a Black Wall Street, the same thing happened to it, the deconstruction of it with the, the with the um a federal interstate came through and interrupted it. So this is some of the protest signs that you would see back in the day related to a white man's road coming straight through the black man's home. And then now you see some of the movements where the current presidential administration, they said they want to reconnect it. They want to bring it back. Like they basically saying like, look, sorry that happened to you. Um, let us fix that. But then you have a lot of people coming back and protesting saying it's too late. <laughs> we ain't over that no more. So and this is the art article about Baltimore. So I didn't even list Baltimore in the other one, but there was another one where it happened. And if I was there, you have to say Baltimore, not Baltimore, Baltimore. <laughs> Here's some a few more. Um, so racism and roads. Cities hope that Biden infrastructure funds will help reconnect black neighborhoods. And another one, um, I think this one is in Austin, Texas, on the right there. Urban renewal, urban renewal or urban removal. I added this one after my last workshop that I did here on the Zoom. Um, Frenchie Bynes, who's her family owned uh Bynes and Royals funeral home, she was sharing at me like her grandmother remembered when this happened to West Broad Street, when the interstate was coming through and they were displaced and told they had to move. And then they moved, I think it was, is it right there on Jones Street, Hall Street, one of the two streets that they're on now. But before that, they went on West Broad Street. The city was calling it urban renewal. Her grandmother called it urban removal which makes a lot more sense. Language is so important, how you say it. Like even today, like I don't say slaves, I might say slavery, but I don't say like we were slave. If you listen to me, like I say like enslaved because it makes a difference. One is a, is a you're claiming that identity. We weren't slaves. That's something that happened to us. That was a circumstance. We were enslaved. Yeah, we weren't slaves. So if you want to learn some more and see where I kind of got my information from, Crack T, my book, Drums and Shadows, which is a really amazing project. Those slave narratives that I was talking about, this came from that. This That was the uh, Savannah and Sea Islands, Georgia Sea Islands aspect of those um, interviews. Slavery and Freedom in Savannah, W.W. Law and His People, go to the museum. Actually, oh, because Wage Earners Bank, where that was on West Broad Street, that is now the Ralph Mark Gilbert Civil Rights Museum. And you can still see like the doors to the, um, to the vaults and things like that in there. And also consider taking day clean journeys tours with Jamal Ture or Amir Ture. Um, and if anybody have any questions, I am here for it. I noticed you said that they had a, uh, a boycott in 1963, but I remembered there was a young man from Savannah State who uh, got run over by an owner of Punch and Judy, and they had a boycott then. Wow. See, and I didn't even know about that one, but I would love to know more about that one. And did they boycott Punch and Judy specifically or like the whole area or no, what? No, 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 Punch, Punch and Judy specifically because the owner of that store's son 
ran over the black guy from Savannah State and mm -hmm. Punch and Judy lost their business, which is why they're now on Habersham Street. They mm -hmm. put them out of business. I'm not sure if anybody else remembers that. Yeah, I would love to know more about that, but I mean, I'm writing that down or, you know, look more into that too. Thank you for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question about the population? You said, um, uh, I think there was one time that you said there was 85% uh, um, African Americans in Savannah. Mm -hmm. What year was that? What did no. you say? Um, I don't remember the year. Let me go back and look in the presentation real quick, but it was 53%. 53, that, okay. Yeah, and that was in 1825. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and that population is, probably increased since then in terms of the the proportion of blacks versus whites in savannah not a lot so every now and then like it might go like i think the highest number i've ever seen it like it hit 55 percent, and even today it's just a little bit over 50 percent um okay. black so yeah so every now and then it fluctuates but it never really go into the 60s and 70s although i mean you know of course that always depends too like how you who, who's all being counted and how are you yeah. counting but that to me goes back to the point you made about how black and white feel like they were married economically, right? We got to make this money together because we mm -hmm. depend on each other. Right. Um, yeah. You made a great presentation. This was awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think you should be at every public school teaching this history. I learned a lot about Sosie Johnson and that. I, mm -hmm. I actually graduated in 1995. I had no clue until you just mm -hmm. shared the history that you did. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You so yeah. And I went to school with um, Curtis and Constance Cooper. Um, they were, we were in the same school together, but I didn't know the history, you know, their father. I knew about the medical facilities and it was named after them, but I had no idea. So that was very interesting. And the information about Saul C. Johnson, because, you know, you know, the school is named after him, just like the uh, young lady said, but you just don't know the history behind and what, what all was involved in the work that they did to really, um, you know, help the city. Right, right. Everybody was hands on. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I I enjoy. Hey, how how you doing? Peace now. All right. Um, I I, I the presentation was was awesome. Right. Uh, I loved when you were talking about how um black people at that time were living on the on, on the edges of the city and that they had some autonomy there because we only get kind of like that narrative. I definitely want to want to dig into uh, to that a lot more and anything that you um, have on that, I would love, love to, uh, to you know, to see and read as well. I would definitely say connect with um, Dr. Vonette Walker, Good Walker. And she's the director over at the Ralph uh, Gilbert Museum. Okay. So yeah, she's a, she'd be a really good starting point for that. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, I thought that was interesting too. Yeah, because even before slavery and after like, Oh, so if we were like urban slavery. If we weren't plantation style, because on plantations, you know, it'd be like little shacks right on the land. But now nah, it was different. <laughs> like we were on the outskirts of the city. It's interesting. Not in all places, because we still know like in a lot of museums that are now museums now, but they were, you know, basically plantation homes then. Some of them still had little houses in the back. But if you didn't really have like a mansion, nah, they ain't lived there. They, they, yeah. I was, uh, I was recently driving from Savannah down to North Florida. And uh, I've, I've taken that trip a, a few times, but just recently I was just looking at that swampy, you know, like the, really just the area. And I was like, I get it. When they made it down there, the people were like, nah, that's it. <laughs> you good. <laughs> like, Cause you're not coming through um, through there. Have you, um, have you read or looked at this book called Savannah River Plantations before? Mm -mm. That's uh, one I've been, uh, I'll, I'll put it up right here. I've been checking this out as well as um, Africanisms and the Gullah oh, dialect. That's one of my favorite ones, yeah. Both of, the, both of those are like really, really uh, interesting. I've been I've been digging in, into both of those. Yeah, and I, that last book that you held up, the uh, I remember one of my favorite parts in there, he was talking about like Savannah was one of the most African cities in the country at that time. And yeah. I was like, ooh. So they like, and when I t share that with my young people, I was like, what does that mean? Like, and a few of them get it, but it's like, I mean, this is where you can come and be a black person. Like you don't have to try to pretend or assimilate or try to be anything else to make there it. Go. There be you go. Yourself, and you can win, like being your blackest self. And that is important. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, Charlene, I was wondering if you would, could you tell us a little bit about the freshwater? Oh, the freshwater Africans? Yeah. yeah, so that's kind of kind of goes back to kind of what he was saying when he was driving in, in that swampy area too. Like, so that was considered the maroon societies. That's exactly what I was talking about. A lot of those freshwater Africans. So you fresh here, like you, you fresh off the boat. You, you know what I'm saying? You still got your language, your culture, your African culture together. You still fighting back. A lot of that resistance is still in place. Those maroon societies, a lot of times in these areas, they lived in like them swampy areas. So if you look back in, in like into the woods sometimes, and it was like the, the land was hard to live on. It was hard to cultivate and they got back there and still just made it happen and if you think about how long too that they were back there they were birthing their own babies in that kind of area they were building houses back there they were armed um they were still feeding themselves they were hunting like they created their own society and communities back there and they were so gangster like literally that the enslavers just agreed to leave them alone like they didn't want that what they said they like they didn't want that smoke it was just like, I'd rather just like, I just all I need y'all to do, just don't come try to free no more people and, I, and we'll leave y'all alone. And that was the contract all over the world. So I remember like one of them that ultimately didn't work was in New Orleans. I can't remember the exact name of it because it was a French name, of course, because we know France owned Louisiana at that time, but they actually end up, because Andrew Jackson got involved. He was the president of the United States and he was like, now nah, I'm coming up in there and we about to like, and they had to bring the full force of the US military to, you know, bring them down. But otherwise, yeah, you had them in Virginia and North Carolina and everywhere that slave, Canada, everywhere that slavery existed, you had a society of freshwater Africans or slash Maroons. That's how you would read about it if you want to research it, Maroons. And they existed fighting back. All the, we we never see we never stopped fighting back. We never didn't fight back. Our fight back just showed up in different ways. We fought back and just the through the vote with our money, with our fists, like however it was needed to the first law of, the first na rule the first law of nature is self preservation, right? <laughs> yep. And so that's what I tell a lot of young people too. I was like, if you ever feel like, like people calling you a rebel or you got so much energy and anger stirred up in you, that might be that freshwater blood in you. You know, like connect with some, like connect with some other people who can like guide you and, sh and help tell you what to do with that energy. Like you ain't gotta just let it die out or go, go out and kill each other. You know, like figure out what you can do with that. Cause it's obviously it's something when you mad that ain't that emotion exists because there's some kind of change that needs to be made and you know it, but maybe you can't articulate or you can't communicate it, but it's like, so you need somebody to help you get to the bottom of it and figure it out what it is, what needs to be changed and trans use that energy to create that change. Just like so many black people was doing back in the day when something was wrong, we changed it, we changed it. Um, um, does anyone else have any questions for Ms. Trelawney? And I know that you showed a picture earlier. You said, um, did you describe all of the buildings? Because I know we have a few elders uh, here today. They, they may know uh, the names of some of those buildings. And I know we got quite a few that's on here today. Let me go back to my... All right, here it is. Okay. So if anyone would recognize some of these buildings, please let Ms. Chelani know. Well, I'm not an elder, but I do recognize some of those buildings. Um, that one on the, the Tenenbaum, I think that, um, was, it, was that where the B&B &B paint or something is right on the corner? Mm -hmm. No? It just looks familiar to me. <laughs> I think so, Stacy. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think... recognize the Star Theater, of course, but I think yeah. that, yeah. Uh, and then it, that it was called something else, too, and I, I can't remember the name, but I definitely remember my mom taking me in there to buy a big walking black doll for Christmas one year. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I cannot remember the name what it was okay i'll think of it soon though 
in the um, okay. Civil Rights Museum, they have a really dope exhibit for West Broad Street. Like when you go in there, all the walls is just like what used to be there, who were the business owners there. It's not everything, but it's a lot of stuff that was there. Yeah, that's a beautiful exhibit up there. Okay, I just wanted to say, I thought you did a wonderful presentation. Uh, Thank you. I'm Savannah raised and, and uh, I was brought up here. And that Star Theater, when I saw that, that brought back memories. That's where mm -hmm. I've gotten my love for movies from. I spent many uh, days as a young child at that Star Theater, 10 cents admittance. But it, was, <laughs> it just brought all my days of movie loving. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I can remember Yakum and Yakum. I can remember Tenenbaum. I can remember the Star Theater. I also remember the Dunbar Theater. And um, there was Black Studios and all. I can't remember all of them. I remember, you know, some of them, but some of them had gone away. And so mm -hmm. I can't remember them now. Nice. And yes. I love your presentation. Thank you. I learned more about the Savannah and the history than I've ever known. Of course, I knew Curtis Cooper. I knew his brother. We all went to school together. They was ahead of me in school. And um, it's just amazing. It's just amazing of things that we actually don't know about Savannah. So you did a very, very good job. Thank you so much. Yeah, I did. Okay. And Cassie, my mom always talks about, um, she calls it Carnegie. That's what they <laughs> called it back then, Carnegie. But that was the library that they went to. And she said they would always go to Carnegie Library. And that was, and saw, didn't know Saucy Johnson had something to do with that. Um, and that she always talks about that. You know, one day I'm going to take her there so she can see the new Carnegie. Uh, see what it looks like now, but it is a you know it's a very nice. It's still an old. It is. Old, it has that structure, it's but it's a building. nice building. Yeah. So they have outside 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 outside. beautiful libraries in Georgia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's your I think it, it still has the steps, and I hope they got a. They have an elevator. elevator. Okay. <laughs> I'll take you on the elevator. We do have an elevator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll take, I'm going to, maybe after COVID, I'll take the seniors on a, on a field trip there. We'll That'll be there. great. That'll uh, be great. Yeah. All right. Before oh, you so hang out, uh, leave, I would like to ask you about uh, Madam Birdie Friedman. Was okay. she mulatto or was she white? Um, She was not white. Um, she might have been mulatto. Now, problem is because that picture you can't really tell. Um, so I'm assuming she might have just had some white up in there. Maybe one of her grandparents, the great grandparents, was, was which wasn't rare, you know, during that time. But on, uh, at least on the census, she marked off that she was a Negro woman. And, and the maroon people, I, I, where would I find any information on them? You can just research um, probably slavery and maroons. If you okay. want to like um if you want to do it specifically for Savannah, I would say start off with that book Slavery um Slavery and Freedom in Savannah. Okay. Yeah, that if specifically, but like I said, I started studying it. Um I want I was just curious all over the world where it existed. So if you want just a broader context, yeah, just start off there. You put like slavery, maroon community, things like that. And you will see all of them and all like you like in Jamaica, they kind of they lived up in the hills and the mountains, but like in the, in our areas in the coastal areas, they were like in the swampy areas and things like okay. that. Okay. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. So but I remember yeah. what, I'm sorry, look, just one little thing. When you were talking about Yakim and Yakim, I remember as a little girl, my mother would take us there <laughs> and I we got two outfits. So I always remember getting kids, and I remember when it burnt mm -hmm. down was when Martin Luther King was assassinated. Mm -hmm. That's when it burnt down, when they had the riots. Wow. See, I didn't know that. Now, see, every time I give a presentation, I add things like this that y'all are telling me. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, Trelawney, again, we want to thank you on behalf of Live Oak Public Libraries and all the participants. And, you know, uh, Trelawney also mentioned now that if you do 
have some pictures of um, West Broad Street or some of these familiar places and you don't mind giving us a copy or making a photocopy, um, certainly you can send it to Cassie over at Carnegie Library or myself, Sandra, here at the WW Law Branch and we'll be happy to forward that on uh, to Trelawney, especially since a lot of the elders are on here today and present. Remind you also that you have to stop by Carnegie Library. It still has uh, one of the most unique uh, collections in, in our entire branch because it has a lot of historic, uh, one of a kind, um, blacks on, you know, um, books on black history. So please make sure you check that out and do not, do not fail to, to check out um, Crack Tea. And that's uh, our wonderful um, pre presenter here today. So make sure you hey. get <laughs> I'm so, I just Girl, ask, I just, where's your book sold? Um, go to the website so nobody else cut into my money. Um, you can go to crack.com. Okay. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. All right, so y'all do that. And again, we, we love your presentation. We're looking forward to you coming back again. And I see Stacy has her hand up as well, so. No, I just wanted to say, I thought it was a good idea. Um, you mentioned that take pictures, you know, now, you know, and I think that's a very good idea. I know that my mother and I had a cousin that actually interviewed my grandmother, she died, um, but they have it on tape you know, good. asking her questions and that. And that's good. And if you have, sometimes if you have the pictures to go along with some of that, yeah. I think it's a great idea. So and to, do, and to do something with your pictures too. Mm -hmm. Like if you know your mom or your grandmother yeah, got like a yeah. box of old yeah. pictures or the photo albums, figure out who gonna get them, you know, when they're no longer living. Because a lot of times, like so many people tell me like somebody just died and they stuff on the curb and it's a big old box of pictures. You might want to come look through it. And it's mm -hmm. so much of that stuff just go to the dump. And I can just yeah. only imagine how many beautiful valuable even if it's just a family picture in front of a car i love pictures like that so it's like yeah definitely find somewhere to like the, the historical society the libraries the museums like find somewhere to safe hold you know those pictures if nobody else in the family want them or can get them charlie i think you're gonna be up for writing another crack tea Oh yeah, Two, three and four. <laughs> so you guys, um, make sure you get all your information. I'm sorry. Uh, hopefully, um, we we'll get back with you. I heard had someone asking me, are you going to do another presentation anytime soon in this area? Mm, no, I know I'm going to Saint Simon's Island soon, but I don't think it's Savannah for a while. But if somebody want to call me up, I'll answer the phone. All right, we got you, <laughs> got you. And uh, so um, Miss, um, Miss uh, Cassie has um, the information from Miss Trelawney over at the Carnegie Branch Library. So if you need any contact information or you can, uh, are you on Facebook, Twitter and all of those? Oh, uh, Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, at Crack Tea, same place. There you go. So y'all know where to find her. And again, we thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. We got a few more special programs. Um, you can check them out on our website at liveoakpubliclibraries.com and um, .org. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys again. Thank y'all for coming. And thank you, Ms. Charlie. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, excellent. Salute. Yes. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody. You too.